Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be learning about the difference between two major cities and two ideologies, that of Jerusalem and that of Babylon. Warm welcome to the programme. And uh, my guest today is all the way from Israel. His name is uh, Dr. Dmitry Radajewski. He is the founder and CEO of the Jerusalem Summit, as well as being a journalist and theologian. Um, Dmitry, absolute pleasure to have you on Thank the Middle report. Me. And a special thanks go to Christine Dog for recommending you should be my guest on the programme. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Simon. And uh, Dimitri, can you share with us something um, about uh, about your background? Uh, you, you're born in Russia. Uh, you're Jewish. So, what was it like um, being a Jewish person uh, growing up in uh, in in Russia? Well, I, I grew up in a um, atheist family, like everyone um, in the Soviet Union. It was mandatory. You were forbidden to have uh, the Bible. My father, my late father, still he told me stories from the uh, Torah, I knew the uh, sort of exodus of our prophets, uh, but uh, I could not talk about that at school, for example, uh, and I could not even find the Bible. But my father um, was a subscriber of an atheistic magazine called Science and Religion, and they put their extracts from the Bible, and then Soviet propaganda explaining why these abstracts are wrong. But somehow my heart felt that this is true and propaganda is wrong. So my first Bible reading were from the Soviet atheistic magazine, uh, Science and Religion. And then God brought me uh, to journalism and then I was invited to, to the US to work as an intern at Time magazine. And then, uh, because I became very much interested in learning about God, I went to uh, Harvard Divinity School to study comparative theology. So I'm, I'm theologian, but my uh, long uh, experience in different media and in different countries and in Israel, and my uh, joint work with Christian Friends of Israel showed me that I actually hate theology, being a theologian, because theology is words about God, and words separate people. Instead, we have to have Theophilia, love of God, because love unites and words about God, they separate. And there are a lot of misunderstandings, tragic misunderstandings between Jews and Christians, and we'll hopefully we'll come to that later in the program. They come from words, from different dogmats, not from the essence, not from love. Absolutely. In, in short, my way. Yeah, and Dimitri, before we, we discuss our, our major topic, I mean, I think it's very interesting for, for our viewers to know um, the extent of what happened to Soviet Jewry, because under the Soviet Union, ever since the uh, Marxist Revolution of 1917, um, the Jewish people and the whole people of Russia weren't allowed to practice any religion apart from the official state religion, which was Russian Orthodoxy. So what was it like growing up in the... Um, in the Soviet Union um, and being Jewish, and what discrimination did you face? Uh, well, um, my, 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 for example, my last name is my um, uh, the, uh, is the name of my mother's line because it sounds less Jewish than father's name ah. and I, uh, last name, and I had to change it bef uh, in the in the uh, and the end of the. Uh, high school, because yes, people when they saw uh, an obviously Jewish last name, you were discriminated. It was, it was, uh, it was. Uh, you could face very unpleasant experiences. This is one thing. Uh, but uh, I, I um, graduated from. I finished school when uh, there was already Gorbachev, and religion became uh, became rehabilitated. And as you know, well, there was a mass exodus of Soviet Jewry yeah. to Israel, and they, a lot of them got back 
to the to the roots of their faith. And in Russian, in Russia, there is a Christian revival. So, uh, well, it's uh, w not without its own problems, but the situation is different. Excellent. And uh, you've written a book uh, comparing the difference between Jerusalem and uh, Babylon. So I'm very keen to know um, about your book and your particular theory about the significance of these two uh, cities, um, the difference between God's view and that of man's view. Uh, yes, thank you, Simon. I, um, I'm, I'm taking a spiritual look at history, and if we, as uh, believers, look at history, will discern that it consists, its main process is striving for unity. And the thing is that uh, not only God wants humans to be united, it's his adversary, Satan, the great deceiver. He, uh, on the face of it, he also leads humanity to unity. He just offers his alternative. He says it's quicker, it's more reliable than God's way. And the way Satan, all through history, tries to unite people is through the way of some totalitarian ideology or some fashionable ideology. And I call it the way of Babylon. And God chose a small nation to be an example of different way to unity. Unity based on understanding God's laws and on love. And this small people chosen for that mission are Jews. And every time, let's take a look uh, at the ancient history. Um, sometimes when I ask my friends, when, when did the first Holocaust happen? They, they have a moment of silence. The first Holocaust happened in ancient Egypt. Extermination of young males was extermination of the nation. It was Holocaust. Uh, but why did it happen? Because Pharaoh, an Egyptian empire, was the first known huge example of the Babylonian project, of that attempt to unite all the known ancient world in worshiping Pharaoh. It was an Egyptian unity, Egyptian empire, way of Babylon. And God raised a small tribe of slaves to show that there is an alternative. And the mystery of Jewish nation that we can perform the mission, the task God gives us only when we are brought to the land chosen for us to the by the Almighty. It's like pure physics. Jews like gunpowder, if they're spread evenly on the surface in, in exile, this gunpowder is powerless. But if you condense it, combine it in a small container of the Holy Land, you create an explosive concentration and it produces a spiritual explosion which destroys the forces of darkness. And every time God prepares Jews for the Exodus so that they, in their Holy Land they can produce an explosion for the sake of all humanity, Satan tries to destroy them. So Holocaust every time happens only on the brink of Exodus. Pharaoh tried to destroy the Jews on the brink of the Exodus because that Exodus produced the explosion of monotheism. Jews brought the knowledge of one God and his laws to humanity. Absolutely. And, then, and when did the second Holocaust almost happen? In ancient Iran, Persia? Exactly, exactly. Purim. Purim. And why? Because historically, if we look on the large picture, it was the second exodus from Babylon, and the result of that period of the second temple was Yeshua HaMashiach. It was a, the second greatest explosion of light for entire humanity. And Satan tried to stop it at Purim, and it didn't work out. And then, there were 2,000 years of exile after the destruction of the Second Temple. And I always tell to my Christian friends that Israel and Jesus walk parallelly in history. And actually, Israel is the Christ of history. Because Jesus 
went on a cross to sacrifice himself for many. And Israel went on a cross of history, on a cross of suffering, of exile for 2,000 years, despicable suffering for the sake of many, because this is Romans 11, because it was, the rejection was for the sake of the nations. And the nations didn't appreciate that. They spat at the crucified Israel for 2,000 years, they humiliated him, they tortured him, and Israel, as Jesus was for two days in the grave and then resurrected. So Israel, as a collective suffering Mashiach, was for 2,000 years, for two millennia, in the grave of history, and then resurrected in front of our eyes. Absolutely, in fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. Yes, dry bones. bones, yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So um, you, you talked about three or uh, two explosions of, of history when the Jewish people are, are on the verge of Exodus, yes. um, going back to the time of uh, ancient uh, Egypt, um, time of the pharaohs, and that of ancient uh, Persia. Um, are we now approaching a third? Exactly. And when Zionism was in the full force, the, the prophets of Zionism, starting from Theodor Herzl, but he was not the, he was the first, but not the only prophet of the ancient scope of Zionism. There was Zev Jabotinsky, the Russian Jew, and Max Nordau. They envisioned in the 20s and 30s, they envisioned, they envisioned God's plan of restoration of Israel and the possible, uh, not, not only possible, the growing Satan's attack. So they roamed Europe, European Jewish communities, and pleaded with Jews. And Max Nordau was saying, one third of you will escape in Israel, one third of you will assimilate, and one third of you will be exterminated. And Zev Jabotinsky was saying, liquidate diaspora, or diaspora will liquidate you. But the Jews, most of the Jews, they were not ready for that prophetic calling. And they were stuck in Europe, and they perished. Because God was, as you said, was planning the third exodus, the third explosion of light. And Nazism was Satan's attempt to prevent that. And, but Israel, God's plan prevailed, Israel was resurrected. And uh, when, when there is Easter, I'm telling my, my friends who, uh, who, who pronounce in churches Christ his risen, I'm saying, you now can also pronounce Israel is risen. It's a great celebration for the entire Bible-believing world. So Israel was restored again for the special mission, not only as a symbol, not only as the promise of wonderful things coming, but for a mission to be first the true center of unity for the humanity. It will not be New York, UN, this modern Tower of Babel. It will not be Brussels, the European Parliament. It will not be, I don't know, the Vatican. It will be Jerusalem, the true center for unity. Humanity strives to unite in love and veneration and service to one God. And he has restored the true center for unity. And second purpose is that Israel is a command and control center in the fight, in the battle, which we all wage, sometimes unknowingly. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to to tell you a little bit about my thinking about understanding of that battle, that we are now uh, resisting not one uh, false way of Babylon, like we resisted Pharaoh or Persian kings or Hitler. We are now in the midst of an attack from two sides. Babylon has strengthened, strengthened himself and now is attacking us with two false paradigms, false projects of unity. Satan, on one hand, tells humanity, let's unite in humanism, that a private human being with all his rights and desires and passions is the ultimate good, is the ultimate God. And whatever he desires, if it's not violating the criminal code, is sacred. So let's unite in our desire to placate ourselves. And this paradigm is called man without God. Man and his passions is deified. Mm. 
And this paradigm was aggressively offered by globalism after the end of the Second War to the entire world, end of history. Liberal democracy, nothing sacred matters, whatever, whatever person desires is the, whole, is the holy right. Let's unite in globalism, post-liberalism, atheism. And the violent reaction against that was offered by Islamism. They said, no, 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 we do not want unity without God. And they offered another distorted way for unity, another way of Babylon. They said, no, we should all bend to our totalitarian interpretation of Allah's will. This is way of Islamism. And I call it God without man. There is totalitarian, cruel God, and there is no respect for the value of human life, human dignity, human rights, etc. So we are in the midst of a clash of two dead-end projects. Man without God, Western post-liberalism, and Islamism, God without man. And we as believers, Israel and the church, we have to offer an alternative, man meeting God. And Israel is the, I'm saying, command and control center in that battle. And like in any battle, enemy tries to destroy the command and control center. When you destroy the center, the battle is over. You still can have a large army, but you are finished. That's why Israel is attacked venomously and viciously from two sides by the extreme left. It blows your mind. Why uh, Western liberals attack the only beacon of democracy and liberalism in the Middle East? Why members of uh, UK Parliament venomously call for boycott of Israel, etc., etc.? Uh, because in the realm of spirit, they are driven by the spirit of Babylon. Because Israel is an alternative to their idol, man without God. And why Islamism? You just uh, last week there was barrages of rockets from Gaza. Why they're so obsessed with destroying Israel? Because Israel is an alternative. That's why we have to we have to stand together and we have to understand that this is a fight also, as we know, in the realm of spirit with powers and principalities. And our deluded brothers, liberals, post-liberals rather, uh, in the West, they have to understand that attacking Israel, they are cutting the branch they're sitting on, they're cutting the root of their own tree. Absolutely. I, I, I like your thinking, Dimitri. Um, but, but, I mean, ultimately, we know where this leads, don't we? And, um, you know, when we're living in this uh, very militant, secular age that has absolutely zero tolerance for Christianity or Judaism, um, certainly wants to move away from our Judeo-Christian heritage in the West that uh, has been our anchorage for centuries. Um, but they, we know when we look at the book of Revelation, for example, uh, and look at Revelation 13, we know that ultimate religion in the end will be Satanism. So how do we go from, say, secular humanism or extreme secular humanism to full-blown Satanism in the tribulation? Uh, well, I, I think that all, uh, th this is the Jewish thinking, all our prophets and our teachers, they said whatever is written in prophetic books, the negative prophecies, prophecies of warning, they're not there to instill in us the spirit of doom that Satan will win anyway. They will. No, it's a warning. It's, it, it can be changed if we repent and unite and stay strong. It's a warning what may happen if we will not repent, if we will not unite. Because I, I, I absolutely, I'm absolutely confident that Israel was restored to lead humanity to the ultimate victory. There may be ups and downs. Uh, uh, well, take, take, take uh, the fight with Islamism. Some of our, I, I always argue with my, uh, some of my Christian friends about that. Because the, I think there's a wrong thinking that God wants to uh, destroy Islam and uh, have ultimate victory of Christendom over Islam. No, I, I don't think this is God's plan because God loves uh, Muslims, and there are a lot of wonderful uh, Muslims, uh, peaceful, 
uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful people. But uh, the spiritual house of Islam is occupied or in the process of being occupied by the forces of darkness, by Islamism. And God has restored Israel in the midst of Islam, in the midst of that Islamic sea, to help them clean their house. Because Israel loves Ishmael as his brother. Israel was sent for them to help them. That's why Israel is uh, actually being attacked. This is the safe haven for uh, Muslims in the Middle East. They may uh, give the lip service and attack Israel, but they all, like we see with Palestinians, they all, by all means, try to get Israeli citizenship because <laughs> their dream is to live in Israel, not to destroy Israel. But in fact, if you take an individual and ask, what do you want? He says, I would like to live in Israel because this is the democracy. You can practice your faith, including Islam, freely. That's, this is why 20% of the Israeli population, Israeli Arabs, they will not trade the Israeli passport for Palestinian passport or Jordanian passport because this is their treasure. They live as free citizens. They, they, uh, they are ministers in Knesset. Uh, they prosper. And Israel, it's, it's important to understand, Israel is not the impediment to peace with Islam. Israel is the main hope for peace with Islam. And do you think we, 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 we are beginning to see that with uh, Israel's new strategic alliances being made in the Sunni world? I mean, um, it was only recently that the Prime Minister was invited by the Sultan of Oman to an official state visit, which would have been unthinkable even six months ago. Um, Israel developing strong ties with the Gulf states, with Saudi Arabia, and also this realisation, I think, in the Sunni Arab world that, that Israel's going nowhere. Uh, and what is the reason why Israel is going, is going nowhere when the other surrounding Arab states States are, are disintegrating. No, uh, uh, thank you. Excellent question. Uh, exactly, because th there is real mafreel politic, and Israel is strong, and uh, all the uh, regimes which succumb to Islamism they cause only chaos and disintegration. And so, uh, in the realm of po real politic, uh, the, the Gulf states they understand that Israel is their best ally against uh, Sunni. Uh, Islamism or Iran, which wants to dominate the Middle East. But in the realm of spirit, this is a first step, and Lord willing, we'll see the end of that road, a first step towards Muslim Zionism. hundred years ago, would you believe that there will be millions and millions of Christian Zionists? No, just a hundred years ago. So I'm telling you, it's my small prophecy. In 50 years, there will be millions of Muslim Zionists. Because if, if there is a will and the uh, assistance of Holy Spirit, and there will be, Muslims will, uh, their spiritual eyes will unveil, and they will see that even in Quran, there are a lot of prophecies that in the end of days, Allah will bring Banu Israel, sons of Israel, back to the land which Allah gained to, gave to them. And there are wonderful Muslim clerics. They are, for now, they are isolated. But they say that in Hadith, in the sayings of the Prophet, there is a prophecy that in the end, heresy will penetrate every house in Ummah, in Muslim, in Muslim world, except for 20 households. And they say this heresy is hatred to Israel. Because they do not understand that by attacking Israel, they violate the, their own uh, religious uh, instructions. They, they violate Quran. Mm. Uh, on uh, another issue, going back to the whole concept of um, secular humanism, as you point it, um, mankind without God, as it were. Um, isn't it extraordinary that we are living in the time of um, Israel's restoration? over 70 years, which is a miracle, which um, means that we're living in biblical times. Um, but also what it points to the fact that, that Israel has re-emerged in the time of globalism, um, that we're seeing the, the loss of 
national sovereignty. You in this country, you can see the, the battle that we have in this country over Brexit. The whole concept of the nation state seems absolutely dead as uh, Western nations move closer and closer to globalist institutions, surrendering their sovereignty. So why do you think that, that God has raised up Israel at a time that if Israel's, say, uh, re-emergence had occurred, I don't know, 50 years ago, people would have understood it, would have embraced it because it was nationalism. But it seems now through very secular militant thinkers and, and those moving in, in um, um, political circles, as it were, um, see the nation state as dead. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on that one, Dimitri. Well, uh, I think that uh, the Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, and actually the, the, the factual Jerusalem, which you visit frequently, Absolutely. the old city has uh, many city. gates. Yes. So these many gates into one Jerusalem uh, are highly symbolic. And uh, our Jewish tradition says that Almighty does not want and does not expect religious uniformity in the world. As one uh, Hasidic rabbi said, what almighty would he be if it will be possible to serve him only by one way? There are many ways to serve him and many ways to come to him. And in the prophecies, in Zechariah, in Isaiah, nations will come to Jerusalem, nations will come up uh, to Zion. Nations, each with its, with its own flag, with its own heritage, and by its own way, by their own gates to Jerusalem. Not for nothing in heavenly and in earthly Jerusalem. There are many gates leading into Jerusalem. So it's important for a, for a human being to remember his roots, his family, have his own way to God. And so for the nation, it's important to take the best out of the national heritage, out of the national exploits, out of the national history, and bring these gems, separate them from the dirt and sins of the nation. That's why it's important to have repentance of the nations. So separate this gold and bring these spiritual gifts to Jerusalem through their own gates, through their own way. But if you destroy nations, national memory, national heritage, national pride, because pride, there is good in pride and bad in pride. And you have to be proud of glorious pages of your national history, of sacrifices, Absolutely. of holiness. Because you throw it out, you don't have gold to bring to Jerusalem, you don't have gold to bring to the temple, to your Lord, your sacrifice to Almighty, you don't have it. You will come empty-handed. You will not come there at all, actually. And this is, this is the, again, in the spiritual realm, this is the ploy, the destruction of national uniqueness. And we're seeing that today very much with the, uh, with the European Union. So do you think that because the whole concept of the European Union is equivalent of a modern-day uh, uh, Baal, and the Tower of Babel, uh, Babel, sorry, that we're now seeing this transferred in our own times as, uh, you know, nation states within the Euro European Union give up their national sovereignty to be part of a bigger project that even denies the existence of God and that God is not even mentioned in the European uh, Union's constitution that was written in 2009. Exactly, exactly. Well, you, you put your finger on it. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm telling also to my, to my Jewish friends when, when we talk about our joint struggle with uh, Christian allies. I'm saying to them, listen, we have to strengthen Christian faith uh, in Europe. By all means, we as Jews, we have to come to them and say, listen, don't take uh, off crosses from the walls in your schools. Like what is in Italy, there was a, a mandatory to take off crosses and it was a big fight. So symbolically, we, Israel, we have to tell, don't take off crosses. Because now, when you have repented for the for the historic scenes of the church, now is the time to strengthen your faith, not to throw it away. Uh, actually, um, love uh, of Christian allies to Israel uh, is reciprocated by love from Israel to Christian allies. Love is a two-way street. And there is something I, I wanted to tell, if I may, um, of course, of course. To, to, to talk about that. Um, 
is a very unorthodox thing and, uh, w and very important, and people try to avoid talking about that. This is the problem that uh, Christian allies of Israel, when they come to Israel, they want to share with them the best they have. And the best they have is Jesus. They want to share their love to Jesus. And we, having 2,000 years of experience with persecution of the church, majority of Jews think that, oh, they did not manage to tear us off from Judaism, from the, our covenant with God through persecution. Now they want to do it through love. So the tragic misunderstanding, and then we're coming back to theology, that the, the trap of words about God, that Jesus, instead of the meeting point between church and Israel, and he's crucified to hold by his hands, Israel and church. So instead of the meeting point, he becomes the stumbling block, the separation. And this is a tragic misunderstanding, and our Christian friends have to uh, accept my words, which are shared by a lot of uh, Jews in Israel and a lot of rabbis, we discuss it with them, uh, accept with love that they should not even think that Jews have to become Christians as they are. Yeah. And that Jews have to abandon the Sinai covenant. Because Jesus came not to abolish it, not to abolish the Torah, but to fulfill it. And until heaven and earth stand, the last Yud, which is the, la the, the tiniest uh, uh, letter in, in Hebrew alphabet, will not be revoked. And our covenant with God, which we collectively entered on Sinai, and it was sprinkled with the blood of sacrificial animals. So we entered, Jews entered the covenant with God on Sinai, it's, it, and it is unbreakable until the end of times. But God wanted all the nations to come to him as well. Everyone, every nation, every person is his child. So they came through suffering Mashiach, Messiah of Israel, Yeshua Mashiach, and nations, they had their covenant on Golgotha. They were sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And now we are living in Messianic times when nations come to the temple of the living God and Jews are there inside this temple, inside the covenant. And children, like sons, sons in faith, church, they come to reunite and to embrace with Father, with Israel who is inside the temple, inside the covenant. And they come to him and, and, and tell them, uh, if church comes to Israel and says, Father, finally we can reunite. We came to the same God you worship. But we came through our own gates, through Jesus. And they can embrace, because now this is the triumph of love. They serve one God there in one temple. But if at that moment church will be tempted to say, Father Israel, we, we came to you through Jesus, through our own gates, but you know what? You have to leave and enter through the same gates as we. He'll say, oh, son, you still don't understand something. That will be the tragic mistake. So I am telling my, my Christian beloved friends that when you come to Israel, build a new covenant of unity with Israel on four pillars of truth, as I understand them. And the first pillar is repentance. Yes, we have to repent uh, for the sins of the church. Absolutely. And the second is unexpected, is learning. Because you have to, there is no shame in learning, in church learning from Israel. And, but there is big arrogance in thinking that church can teach something to Israel which Israel doesn't know. Huh, that's true. Yeah. So yeah. the second is learning. And the third is something which has never happened before, and I hope and pray that it will happen now. The third pillar is strengthening of Israel. 
if church will come to Israel, Christian friends of Israel, and will say, we pray and we help, we want you to be stronger in your covenant with the God of Israel. And this uh, bondage between Israel and God, it also has its trinity. It is the Torah, the land, and the people of Israel. So if Christians will come to Israel and say to rabbis, to our brave, uh, they're called in the West settlers, but they're pioneers of the, of the Jewish land, and will tell them, please be strong in observing the mitzvot, the uh, commandments of the Torah. Be strong in defending Israel. Be strong in sticking to the heritage of your fathers. Be strong Jews, be Torah observant Jews. But it, it, it will be life from the dead. Jews will say, do you really mean that? Absolutely. But is, isn't something else, I think, um, you, you're just, just drawing something out of me, and, and that is the fact is that, you know, within Judaism, there isn't so much a, a concept of a personal relationship with the living God, but if we look at, say, for example, David, we look at the patriarchs, we look at all these great, wonderful figures in, in the, uh, the Torah and the Tanah, uh, as we call it, the Old Testament, it becomes very clear that they had a unique personal yes, relationship yes, with yes. the God of Israel. So it isn't maybe the key that uh, Jewish people understand that unique individual relationship with the God of Israel rather than some of the works and the framework around Judaism? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, another excellent question, because it brings me exactly to the fourth pillar. And the fourth pillar, so first repentance, learning, strengthening of Israel. And the fourth is thanking him, thanking Israel for Yeshua Mashiach. Yeah. For giving yeah. the suffering Mashiach to the nations, this beloved son of Israel, so that nations can come to the relations with the living God, to personal relations with the living God. And a lot, a lot of Jews, it's, it's uh, well, there's so many, all Judaism actually stands, as you said, from King David, or from patriarchs, from Abraham. Uh, it stands on attaining uh, personal relations with God. And there are a lot of, a lot of, like, again, <laughs> in learning, they will, uh, my, our Christian friends will know that uh, most of the Jews, they strive to that. And there is a whole concept of that devikut, which is called gluing yourself to God, feeling him inside of you. Uh, and again, this is theology. Let's not fall into the trap of theology because Jews live in the spirit of Yeshua Mashiach, in the personal love. Those Jews who see God, they live in that spirit. They do not call it by the name of Jesus, but they live in his spirit. And this is the thing which Christians, most of them, feel in Israel. Because while they theoretically theoreticize about Israel and its relations to Messiah, they may fall into theological traps. But when they come to Israel, see the live Jews, talk about God, and feel that love, they see that they live in the spirit of Messiah. Can you, can you explain to me uh, and also to our viewers the kind of unique special time in which we're living in? Um, the fact is that um, this is the only period of world history where the church has, is living alongside the re-established modern state of Israel. Um, because it's only happened in history before, and that was for 40 years um, during the rise of the early church. Uh, and then we saw the destruction of the uh, temple in Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Romans and then the dispersion of the Jewish people throughout the world after that. Um, so we're pretty much in unique times and that was, and Israel wasn't free as a, as a nation then, it was under Roman occupation. So the fact is that the Jewish people today in Israel are free, they have their own government, they, they, and um, they have their own cities, and we see the restoration of Israel in fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and the church is living alongside the modern state of Israel. So what, in your eyes, is God's plan for the church and also for Israel as well in this special period of world history? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, uh, first of all, that Israel will play a pivotal role in uh, the revival of the church. It's, it's very unexpected, but things change with such speed that uh, that we, we will see how uh, church coming to Israel again to, to repent, to learn, and to strengthen Israel will gain in return so much so much of a new understanding of Jesus, of gospel, of the roots of faith. 
and will be strengthened in return so much to be strong in faith and to stand for faith in the West. That this dynamic relations of love will lead to Christian revival in the West. I'm, uh, I, I, um, I'm a big patriot, for example, of UK. My, uh, my children, uh, I worked there uh, here for a long time. My, uh, three of my children grew up here. I love this country and I love its sterling Christian heart heart of Sir Winston Churchill. He stood at, at one time alone against the forces of darkness and he was driven, there's an excellent book, he was driven by faith. He didn't wear his Christian faith on his sleeve, but he was believer deep in his heart. Faith gave him strength. So I believe that Britain... And he had a special place in his heart for the Jewish people as well. Yes. And I believe that Britain has started the process of disintegration of godless European Union, yep. not to destroy European Union, but to lead Europe to new Bible-based unity. It can be unity of Christian Bible-believing nations, which retain their national uniqueness, but they form a unity in foreign policy, in standing to common threats, based on the common biblical heritage. And Britain can show the way, can show an alternative, saying, guys, maybe European Union as it is, is doomed because it is godless. Let's form a Bible-based unity. But aren't we seeing this in the States now? With uh, President I, Trump and his yes, administration? Yes, I think, uh, I, and, I, think, I think we do. And a realignment of American foreign policy with, uh, with God's agenda and his kingdom. Yes. Uh, uh, and we, we've seen that this year with the symbolic moving of the embassy from Tel Aviv to yes. Jerusalem and, yes. and President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So what does that mean for the United States? Because clearly when we look at um, uh, the book of Genesis 12, those nations that bless Israel will be blessed and those nations that curse Israel will be cursed and that curse is very real and that blessing is very real. So the fact is that we have um, a US administration filled with Christian Zionists um, who are determined to stand with Israel. And it's almost as if American foreign policy, particularly in the United Nations and elsewhere in the Middle East, is gearing up to do everything they can to protect Israel, which is unique in American history and politics. Yes, well, I, I, I think that uh, it's my, my personal uh, metaphor. Uh, modern United States is uh, like the uh, ancient Roman Empire. It's the Rome of today. And there are some striking parallels. There's, there's Senate, there's Capitol Hill, yeah. and there's Roman eagle on the emblem, etc., etc. And it's the overwhelming power. Every, world, every educated uh, citizen in the world speaks uh, like they spoke Latin, they speak English, they use American money, American entertainment, etc., etc. Uh, but this Rome will survive only if it will correct the sin of the ancient Rome. The ancient Rome has destroyed Israel and the temple. If this Rome will protect Israel and will help Israel actually to restore the temple, then it will prosper and will survive and will um, redeem itself. Mm. Uh, because those, uh, you, you, you said it, those, those American politicians uh, who thought that they can uh, pay with Israel uh, for placating uh, Islamism, uh, first, they will not placate Islamism because as we said earlier, uh, Israel is not the problem with Islam, Israel is the solution with Islam. Uh, and second, they would uh, bring uh, America to destruction. So, uh, praise the Lord that uh, American people uh, have chosen Donald Trump. I think he's, he's anointed. Absolutely, which is quite extraordinary. And, and what we're really seeing in, uh, whether it's the United States, with the, the huge divide between the left and the right, uh, whether it's in uh, Britain between the difference between those who support Brexit and those who want to remain in the European Union. Um, despite these uh, um, trolls and tribulations, as it were, uh, it, it seems very much like our Western societies are tearing themselves apart on ideological grounds. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? 
for us. And what's at the heart of this? Um, well, you know what? Um, I think that people who are at peace with God in their heart, uh, they are at peace with their national heritage, with the tradition of their fathers, if it's Christianity, and with Israel. And those who struggle with God inwardly, they struggle with Israel outwardly. And this is a common psychology. It's just substitution. They, they cannot say, blame the world and blaspheme him openly. So they attack his most visible representatives because uh, what, what is Israel? Israel is a witness of God in this world. Now, Israel and the church. So they attack Israel and the church because they have a problem with God. They do not attack. It's not about Israel. It's not about church. It's about their relations with God. Because Christians, for example, Christians who are truly at peace with God, they naturally become friends of Israel. And Christians who are, uh, there is a, with this weird category of Christians who are against Israel. Uh, I think their faith, their relations with God, their personal relations with Jesus is under big, big question. There's some big problem inside their heart. And they substitute this problem with attacking Israel. I agree with you. I completely agree with you on that one, Dimitri. We've got five minutes uh, left from the program, and uh, it's been fascinating. But I have to ask you that um, we, we, we've seen God move um, in times of unprecedented Jew hatred or anti-Semitism. You know, we, we saw that it was a Jew hatred that became the driving force for Theodore Herzl to write the book De Judenstadt after um, witnessing the Dreyfus trial in France. Um, then we saw in the 1930s the rise of Nazism and fascism, and at the heart Part of this was um, uh, a Jew hatred, and it seems like now that we are, the world is facing again that rising spirit of, of Jew hatred in the nations, and particularly the West, and, and pretty much the United States was pretty much immune from that, but we've seen with that recent attack at the uh, Jewish synagogue in Pittsburgh that Jew hatred is also rising in the States, and this usually happens when something very historic is just around the corner. So in your opinion, what do you think we are heading for um, in the next coming coming years if this level of due hatred continues, which is also God's well, warning? We're, uh, as, as we, uh, we're coming back to the start of our talk, we are in the middle of the battle. And Babylon, Babylon senses that actually it approaches its defeat. And it... it uh, adds speed and energy and effort in their attack on Israel. That's why uh, Jew hatred is propelled by two forces, as we said, by, by this paradigm of man without God, by liberals who put themselves on a pedestal, and by uh, radical uh, Islamists. So uh, the Jew hatred is in any country, in the UK, in the US, who are the perpetrators of the attacks? These are, uh, either extreme left or Islamists. Or, well, there, 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 there's a fringe of neo-Nazis, the remnants of that uh, previous uh, failed attempt. But the main two forces of boycott, of divestment, of uh, attacking Jews are radical left and terrorism attacks uh, by, uh, by Islamists. It means that they, in the realm of spirit, they, they feel that they are losing because they cannot destroy Israel. Actually, none of their attempts, uh, economic, political, uh, from the left, will succeed in destroying Israel because it's very strong economically, it's very strong politically. And their attacks uh, from the side of uh, militant Islam, Iran, etc., they will fail. and. Uh, uh, their nuclear weapons in Iran will not help them. Israeli army is extremely strong. We have support of the U.S. And most important, we have support of the Lord God of Israel. So they will fail to destroy us uh, economically, politically. They will fail to destroy us uh, militarily. And if we'll, if we'll be strong in faith, and if we'll stand with our Christian allies, uh, we are 
predestined to win. Uh, and Dimitri, within, um, within less than a minute, can you explain maybe the role of Christian Zionists who love Israel, who are passionate with Israel, standing with Israel, their role and responsibility um, during this unique period of, of world history? Well, they, they, they have to wage war on all fronts, as we in Israel, we have, they have to wage war against, uh, on their home front against deranged post-liberals. They have to wage war against uh, radical Islam. They have to uh, wage war for restoration of Christian values and Christian ethics and Christian heritage in their own countries. It's very important. It's uh, equally important as uh, supporting Israel. But they have to fight in the classrooms, as Sir Winston Churchill said, we'll fight uh, on the landing pads, we'll fight on in the mountains. Beaches. Yes, yes. So y you, you guys, Christian Zionists, you have to fight in schools, in courtrooms, in newspapers, everywhere. And victory will be with us, uh, Lord willing. Dimitri, thank you so much for an absolutely stimulating program. And thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East Report. It's honour and pleasure. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure. Thank you. And I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East report. What we've clearly uh, laid out today is that uh, as Christian supporters of Israel, we're in a spiritual battle um, and uh, we need to pray for Israel and we need to pray for the presence of God to appear and be involved in our nations. And we can only do that by looking up to Yeshua Hamashiach. So we leave this song in ded dedication to the Messiah of Israel. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Say